There were just about 11,000 fans at Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh on September 1st, 1971. But little did those fans know, they were about to witness something special. On that day, the Pittsburgh Pirates quietly made history by becoming the first team in Major League Baseball to field an all-black and Latino lineup. The historic moment never really got the recognition it deserved, even though the Pirates went on to win the World Series that year, beating the defending champion Baltimore Orioles, who famously had four 20-game winners on the mound. The Pirates organization led by example and judged their players solely on their skill sets and not just the color of their skin. Today, three Pirates from that historic season, Manny Sanguian, Dave Cash, and Al Oliver will join us to help tell the story of the 1971 Pirates for this special edition of The Roundtable. First thing I'm going to ask y'all, what was the world even like in 1971 in September? The ABA and the NBA weren't even joined then. It was a completely different era. Forget about baseball, but just tell me a little bit about what this country was like in your mind overall at that point. Al, let's start with you. In 1971, uh, we were just kind of coming off of the racial tension that was going on, the racism, the fighting, the, the burning of, of homes. But the good thing about 1971, when I look back at Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh was somewhat different. And I think what made it different for the guys that you're talking to today, we were very fortunate to have been brought up with a team that was full of Latin players. You know, we always had four or five black and Latin players on these teams. And that kind of crushed a lot of racism that was going on, which took a lot of pressure off of each and every one of us. I got you, Dave, what are your thoughts on that? What do you remember oh. just in terms of the state of the nation at that point in 1971? Pretty much the same. Uh, we, we faced a lot of uh, racism and a, a lot of controversy, especially because we had so many minority players. You know, we were a, a talented group of young players that uh, were fearless, and uh, we weren't going to let any kind of situations like that get in the way of what we had to do. Our business was to, to win games on the field, and that, that was the most important thing. And I think that that what brought us together. Um, we wanted to win that more than anything else. That was the most the driving factor. And we were a positive group, and uh, that year we went out and proved it. Danny? Everybody said we concentrate each other, we love each other. You see burning car and burning stuff, but that's not stop us. We keep going. We had to fight the good battle in the field. Before we get to the big day, let's let's start with the beginning of the season. I mean, look, Mazeroski, Clemente, you know, also Willie Stargell, you guys were led by three titans in sort of baseball lore. Maz, at the end of his career, obviously very important to your career, Cash. What were the expectations of this team going into the season from a baseball standpoint with your club? You know, we had come off of the 1970 season. We had won a division, and that gave us a lot of confidence in going into the 71 season. And we were young and talented. And uh, we had expected great things for us in 71, even on ourselves. We thought we could, we could win. Our main goal was to win the division. Now, once you win the division, then you can get to the series. So that was our main goal, is just to go out and, and, and win the division. And what happens after that uh, will take care of itself. On that day, it was a Wednesday. You look at the lineup card. You see what's going on. I mean, you guys are obviously a tight bunch, and we'll get to that later. But did anybody realize, well, dang. Okay, this is what we're doing today in terms of what's actually going down. Al, did it ever occur to you in the moment that's what was happening? Well, yes and no, because, you know, as a rule, we usually had six on the field anyway, especially if Doc Ellis pitched. Right. The whole outfield was black. Dave was at second. We had Jackie Hernandez, and Sangi was catching. So that's six right there, and Doc made a seven. So we just added two into the picture. And probably one of the best statements that I've ever heard was from Willie Storgel. We just decided to give the white players a day off. <laughs> and that was, <laughs> that was a great statement. But you know what? We put all personal goals aside. And Joe Brown said something that made a lot of sense one time. He said, we draft and we sign not players of color. I don't care what color they are. I don't care what church they go to. 
And I still laugh about it every time I hear it. It doesn't matter what church you go to, as long as you can play baseball. But we liked each other, and we respected each other, because if we all do what we were supposed to do, our chances of winning was good. Manny, what do you remember from that day? I remember I was sitting, they kept sitting down beside me and said, Sandy, we have an all night black to get in the field. I said, wow. And then from there, Roberto come and said, man, my dream come true. I always dream that one day, nine players will want to play in the big league together. So there were less than 12,000 people at that game. You know, it was a home <laughs> game, but it's one of those odd pockets of history that for a sport that depends so much on history is not very well remembered. I mean, I don't, I don't think you guys probably take that personally, but you know, what, do you, what do you think well, about the history of this moment? Well, Clinton, we didn't think about it that, like that. I mean, it was, uh, you know, we were baseball players. We didn't think about, about being part of history as far as that was concerned. You know, we're playing the Philadelphia Phillies, who at that time was all basically all white except for Willie Montanez. Willie played first base for him. But uh, we didn't think about racial things like that. It, our job was to, to win the ball game. Right. Just, just like Dave said, yeah. thank God that we weren't into like they are today in our society. I didn't know anything about politics. The only thing I knew who was president of the United States. <laughs> and that's all that we do. But uh, the fact of the matter is, I'm glad that we thought that way. Politics was not in our agenda at all. Winning was what we were all about. And I'm going to tell you something. I never heard, I don't know about you, Dave, and I don't know about you, Sankey, but I never heard politics mentioned in our clubhouse. No, I never did. What I hear was that, that we needed more uh, more white people. That's the word I hear. That's the <laughs> I mean, Let me ask you this. You guys had a very famous clubhouse in terms of baseball lore, not just the makeup of who you were, but how you operated, the kangaroo court and all that sort of stuff. Looking back <laughs> on it, but for those who don't understand what that is, please do explain how Murtaugh ran that team from an accountability standpoint and making sure everybody, had well, one, everybody got along. We always had a judge. <laughs> and if someone did something wrong, you always had to have two witnesses. <laughs> we did have some guys on our team that could lie. <laughs> if, if, but the one rule that we had that was a no-no, never show up a player on the field. And that was the most important rule that we had. We had so many rules, and we were a <laughs> well-dressed team. I mean, we were probably the cleanest dressed team in baseball. And if your belt wasn't where it should have been, you got fined. If you had a string hanging on your suit or on your pants, you got fined. And I was, we had guys walking around the clubhouse, to the airport, looking for something to find somebody for. And when we messed up, we knew we messed up. You know, we had two guys that knew how to lead. Roberto being our leader, Stargio being the first lieutenant. Roberto could lead by example more so on the field, but he also was good one-on-one. -on -one. If he saw a player not hustling, he wouldn't embarrass them, but he would call them to the side, maybe in the clubhouse or somewhere else. And Stargell was a leader in a different manner. Stargell was better one-on-one, -on -one, and Will would always throw a party if we lost three or four games in a row, which very seldom happened. He enjoyed mixing these drinks up and like purple passion and uh, <laughs> grape juice. And, great, great so great. <laughs> and, and the purpose of it, if I didn't know any better, I think they tried to make me drunk <laughs> because I was a non drinker see? But Will's purpose was I didn't like being platooned. So that was Will's purpose of trying to loosen me up. <laughs> and anybody who's ever had grape juice and green alcohol that would loosen up anybody. The first time I go to Willie Hall party, Roberto said, Sandy, don't drink that because the next day you're going to have it, your eyes really red and you don't want to feel good. I don't know why you took all that, but I never drink it. 
<laughs> you guys had a great relationship well, hey, amongst a lot of you. But Dave, I want to ask you personally about your relationship with Maz and how that well, sort of embodied uh, a lot of this. Yeah. Mazeroski was my mentor. I mean, I was always a shortstop all through minor leagues. And when I got to the big leagues, got to triple A, they changed me to a second baseman. And I had, I knew nothing about that other side of the diamond. Ball comes at you from a different angle. You yeah, have to read the ball. The whole oh, thing, yeah. yeah, especially the double play. If it wasn't for Maz, I mean, I don't know where I would have been as far as turning the double play because I had no idea. But he gave me the footwork. He gave me the keys to the kingdom. Hmm. And all I had to do was just use my natural God-given ability to improve on that. I mean, he didn't have to do that. Here's an aging veteran Hall of Famer who could have just, you know, went away in the sunset. But he, that's the kind of team that we had. You know, people were willing to help each other to make each other better. And uh, I, I still thank him for that. That's good, ball. man. Well, listen, but then you went on and won the Dagon World Series against another team that was pretty interesting, the Orioles. What was that run like in well, the playoffs, never mind getting to the top? Well, let me remind you one other thing, Clint. We yep. had a no-hitter thrown against us during that time. Bob <laughs> Gibson threw a no-hitter against us, and that, that could have wrecked our whole season. But, you know, as strong as we were mentally, we didn't think about it. And as far as, as, as going up against the Orioles, well, they had beat everybody in the American League. They hadn't beat us yet. You know, we, were, we had just defeated a pretty good club in, in, in the San Francisco Giants at the time. We had Willie Mays and McCovey and a whole bunch of other uh, Hall of Famers on that club. So we were really prepared uh, for the Baltimore situation. And then Earl Weaver made a statement that really fired us up. He said, you can't win with Jackie Hernandez playing shortstop. And I think that really set us on fire. Okay. It did. Right. It did. <laughs> Al, what were your thoughts really on did. that run? Uh, the thing that I sit back and I think about, they always said good hitting stops pitching and vice versa. Good pitching stops good hitting. Yeah. But what they forgot to say, good pitching doesn't stop great hitting. And we were great hitters and we were becoming even greater hitters as our careers progressed. You, you talk to the three of us, we are three guys that very seldom struck out. We always put the ball in play and we just didn't care who was pitching because I've never played on a team that when they made it out, they were mad. But I watch players today, they strike out, and they just walk on back to the dugout. But, you know, we had some players on our team when we struck out, me included, we had a tendency to go down in the runway and do some woodwork. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. And Jimmy Hector was another one. And we were called the lumber company. And – there's just they're still trying to figure out who was the president of the lumber company, <laughs> Al Oliver <laughs> or Richie Hebner. Right. <laughs> Tell me a little bit something about Murtaugh and his relationship with you guys, you know, in terms of like how he ran that whole thing. He was a little different than everybody else, but he let you all do your stuff. Danny was the type of manager, if you did your job, you played no matter what color you were or where you came from or anything or those natures. He was concerned with winning ball games. That was his main concern. And if he had something to discipline you on, he wouldn't do it in front of the, the team players. He would call you in his office and undress you if, you, if he had to. He, he had that kind of respect for each player. And I think the players had respect for him because of it. I can't say enough about him. I agree. I appreciate that. Manny? Well, Danny Murta was like in my teacher. You see, when I came into the big league, I don't know nothing about catching because I, I would play anywhere. And then when I came into the big league, then he called me and said, Manny, you have a good talent. I was looking for catching like you. I, I like how you sit down behind a home player. I want you just to learn. Don't listen to the commentary. This uh, has been great, you guys. I got one last question, though. This is really important. I need oh. a story about Doc Ellis from each of you, all right? Because that man is her, you know, his legend is very real, and he had a, you know, he had a very interesting career, and that's a guy who a lot of people know about. But I want to hear what each of you have to say about him. You know what? <laughs> the funniest thing I heard about Doc Ellis, he said, anytime a man can go to the mound, 
and pitch a no-hitter on LSD, he belongs in Cooperstown. <laughs> I hear you. I sat right next to him when he pitched a no-hitter because it was supposed to be taboo about talking about a no-hitter while the guy's pitching. Well, I sat next to him the whole time. And in the seventh inning, he came in and told me, he looked at me and he said, Dave, I got a no-no going. I said, okay, let's get with it. So he went back out, did his job, and he completed the no-hitter. But uh, it might have been the only time in history that someone sat next to a, a guy that pitched a no-hitter and talked about it. That's so, a tough one for me because actually Doc Barry was the best friend that I had in baseball from 1965. Uh, it's really hard to pinpoint. But I'm going to get on a area where Doc wasn't known for. Doc's last 10 years of life, drugs, yes, alcohol, yes. But his last 10 years of life, he turned his life around. And he started out in Los Angeles working with young people who had alcohol and drug problems. And Doc Ellis saved so many lives in California. And one of the best things that ever happened to me is what I didn't know. I knew we were friends. But he had told his wife that if he ever passes away, let Scoop do the eulogy because he is the only guy that can say what needs to be said and say it the right way. That sums up Doc Ellis and my relationship. Doc had a heart as big as the Pacific Ocean, as all of us know. That's good. Looking back on all this, you know, not just the game, but going on the win the World Series and who you guys were as a team, do you think anything changed about the perspectives that the people had on players, Black, Latino, whatever? Do you think that there was something in the collective consciousness that shifted? Because I talked to guys who were fans of your teams who were older than I am, and they all were Pirates fans. You know what I'm saying? In some way or another. You know what I mean? Because they liked one part of the team or one place or the other. Do you think it actually helped in terms of baseball and perhaps America as well? In my travels, the one thing that I've heard, and still up to this day, the, the reason why the Pirates drew well on the road is that we had a lot of personality to our teams. We had characters on our team. And it was a style like no other. And it was a personality that we had that people really enjoyed watching us play. We had some style on our team. I mean, on and off the field, we had style. And that's the thing that I was glad to be a part of. Um, I mean, we were as clean as the Board of Health. Maybe I could uh, sum up our team. A friend of mine once told me about the Pirates. I mean, you guys are confident almost to the point of being cocky to where sometimes your sanity is suspect. I think we just believe that, uh, you know, nobody could be us. We could, we were never out of a ball game, uh, never give up until that 27th out is made. If you don't get us early, we gonna get you late for sure. I love it. Well, guys, thank you so much for this time. I really appreciate it. And it's been really, really fun. I appreciate it.